Thank you guys for tuning in today and welcome to another episode of The Source. Welcome to part two with Dr. Sheer Heber. And we will continue our discussion. So if you haven't watched part one, where we talked about the uprising in West Bank, make sure to check it out. And today we will focus on the Picasso spyware software. Dr. Sheer Heber, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me, James. Can you first explain to our viewers what is this Picasso spyware software? Yeah, so Pegasus is just one uh, of the programs. Uh, it's made by a company called NSO Group, but there are about six Israeli spyware companies that produce different kinds of software, which have the ability to hack into phones and to computers. Now, the spyware is a new kind of technology, uh, which was developed by Israeli graduates of a specific intelligence unit, signal intelligence unit, called uh, 8200, and this unit had hacked people's phones and spied on them, surveilled on them in order on, on Palestinians in order to blackmail them with information that they collect from them and, and turn them into collaborators. And uh, uh, some members of this unit have been shocked and disgusted by what the unit was doing uh, and they exposed the way that the unit operates. But the vast majority of these officers think that it's absolutely fine to violate people's privacy and to blackmail them into becoming collaborators. And then they also thought that it's a great way to become rich. And so they took this technology that was used by the Israeli signal intelligence unit and turned it into a product that is sold around the world, according to Amnesty International, Forbidden Stories, and a Citizen Lab. And they published a very um, comprehensive report last July they identified 45 countries where this software has been uh, purchased and used against lawyers, against human rights activists, against politicians, uh, against uh, just uh, civilians. So it's not a military uh, tool, but it's actually a tool against civilians, against civil society, and against human rights activists. It's the same software that was used uh, to uh, locate uh, Jamal Khashoggi uh, and to find out more about uh, the activities uh, that he was having and who he was corresponding with that the Saudi monarchy uh, basically used to hack his phone. Is that the same one, right? It is the same one, although the Pegasus program has different iterations. The, the one that was used against Jamal Khashoggi in 2018 uh, is a, a, an older version of what is now available on the market. and. One of the very disturbing way that this program develops is that it allows hacking remotely into devices without the person who has the device has any way of knowing that the device was hacked. So your phone, my phone, everyone, uh, we might be hacked already. We don't, we can't know this without actually sending the phone to be forensically analyzed by Citizen Lab or, or a similar organization. And even then, they will only be able to say if, if it was hacked or no. And what is very disturbing about the story of Jamal Khashoggi is that his phone was not hacked, but rather the phone of somebody he corresponded with. He corresponded with a human rights activist in Canada. And the phone in Canada was the one that was hacked. And so the conversations with Jamal Khashoggi were exposed to the Saudi government, and the Saudi government uh, then decided that the, they don't like what uh, Jamal Khashoggi was saying, and they, they, they well, in, in every, all likelihood, although it has not been uh, proven yet in, in court, but I think uh, everyone can uh, can see that there is a very high likelihood that uh, Jamal Khashoggi was murdered in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul, based on the information that the Israeli company has gathered for the Saudi government. This is how it works, which means that even if our phone is not hacked, we could be corresponding with somebody whose phone is hacked, and once again, our information gets to the wrong hands. And this is extremely dangerous, and of course, extremely illegal. It reminds me of uh, what Edward Snowden exposed, uh, uh, of the NSA programs that were actually supposed to uh, surveil foreign targets, but uh, when they were corresponding with Americans, they were able to intercept uh, and expand that to on a domestic level. Getting back to this uh, software, uh, obviously, people here in Germany will ask, uh, well, why does it concern me? What is Germany at the moment uh, doing with Israel? Is it buying the software? Is it involved in any way? And the second part of the question, which you could address after that, is most people would say, hey, I have nothing to hide. You know, uh, why, sh why the government can go and hack me? So how do you respond to that? 
Well, first of all, uh, one branch of the German police, of the German federal police, has bought Pegasus. They bought the company, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the software from NSO Group. Uh, and when this was exposed in the media and they were asked questions about this, what are you going to do with this program and, and uh, who are you spying on, they responded that they have no intention of using it. This is a very expensive software. So if they're telling the truth, they have wasted millions of euros. Uh, if they are lying, then they are spying on German citizens. This is very uh, uh, disturbing and there needs to be an investigation. Right now there is an investigation conducted by the European Union Parliament. Uh, and uh, this, uh, there is a committee of parliament members who has, has also traveled to Israel in order to speak with members of NSO group, to speak with victims of uh, this uh, software, and to collect information. And uh, there will be some kind of reckoning, some kind of uh, accountability process within the European Union uh, to put uh, those officials on trial for buying uh, espionage technology, which normally is used by organizations like the NSA that you mentioned uh, for state-to-state -state espionage level or military-grade espionage. But here we're talking about a company, that a private company, that is taking state-level espionage technology and offering it to the highest bidder. This is a very, very dangerous thing. But I want to address the more important issue, which is when people say, well, maybe this is a tool for uh, law enforcement, the NSO group themselves, they like to say, we use it to, to stop uh, terrorism, we use it to stop crime. First of all, there has not been even one documented case in which spyware was, has, has helped to solve crime or to stop uh, uh, any kind of crime. And there's a good reason for this. Because the tool itself, technologically speaking, is simply uh, not useful for law enforcement. Law enforcement is about transparency. It's about going through very clear procedures. And if you want to collect evidence that can be usable in court, then you need to have a, a, a process of collecting that evidence that can be retraced and observed by the court. Otherwise, whatever evidence you collect is useless. And that's exactly the point. Because like I, I said before, when your phone is then analyzed in a forensic lab, they can know that the phone was hacked, but they don't know when and they don't know by whom, and they don't know uh, what was done to the phone exactly. And it's and this spyware does, allows somebody full control of the device. That means they can remotely oper activate the camera and the microphone to listen to whatever happening around the phone. They can also download data from the phone, but they can also write on the phone. They can write on your social media account using your account in a way that will make it seem like you wrote something that you didn't want to write. This gives a lot of power to the police or anyone who has access to the software. Basically, they could incriminate innocent people with fake evidence. There's no way to find out. And because there is no way to know when exactly they used this program and what they wrote in the phone or in the computer, then this is not something that law enforcement can use. This is something that only works for tyrannies, for, for authoritarian regimes that have no process of internal accountability. And if you look at who are the biggest customers of NSO Group or of Pegasus, these are absolutely authoritarian regimes uh, in countries uh, which which are not even close to democracies. We spoke, we've spoken about Saudi Arabia. We should also mention the United Arab Emirates. We should mention Honduras. We should mention uh, Uganda and, and uh, Chad, Hungary and uh, Belarus. These are places where Israeli spyware has been used against people. Oh, and, and of course, uh, Hong Kong, where the spyware technology was provided to the Chinese authorities in order to crush uh, the freedom movement there. Privacy is an issue uh, that has taken a step back, uh, in my opinion, after the big revelations that we had uh, uh, with Edward Snowden's uh, and Glenn Greenwald's uh, um, exposure of the NSA leaks, and then we had the WikiLeaks uh, always exposing documents, for example, Wall 7 of the CIA, where they could use a Samsung TV to monitor you without the TV even being on. Um, so how is this situation in terms of civil liberties being viewed by Israeli society and media? And uh, how has the second part of the question, how has the, um, has there been any international uh, lashback on this? 
Well, within Israeli society, it's a very complex issue because most Israelis believe that there's no way the Israeli intelligence organizations will use this kind of technology against Israeli citizens. Of course, we are. <laughs> we Israelis don't have to worry about these things. Uh, and then there was a very cleverly um, orchestrated expose in the Israeli media, which exposed that the Israeli police has actually uh, used spyware to spy on Israeli citizens. But the journalist who exposed it was given intentionally false information and published fake evidence uh, and fake testimonies as if the police uh, was using this on ci civilians. This was a very, very smart operation. It was mainly used in order to try to undermine the credibility of some of the witnesses that were speaking against uh, former Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu, who is facing corruption charges. And so this expose was used to say, oh, look, the, the prosecution is using uh, Pegasus in order to uh, uh, plant evidence against uh, Netanyahu, and that means that uh, the uh, evidence against him has to be disregarded. Uh, and after Netanyahu made use of this in his trial, it later came out that the information was fake, was false. That journalist had to retract the accusation. Then everybody w came under, into the false conclusion that that means that actually the spyware was never used against Israeli citizens. But that was a false conclusion. That was a very uh, clever way of people just uh, of having a backlash of people saying, oh, so that, that report was fake, which means we are safe. No, <laughs> actually, uh, there is, uh, later the Israeli police admitted uh, in a much less reported report, uh, uh, a much less reported document that yes, they have been using this technology uh, against uh, protesters, against human rights activists within Israel, against Israeli citizens, absolutely. Uh, but uh, the second part of your question was, um, sorry. The, uh, how's uh, this viewed internationally? Has there any be condemnation from any countries uh, or has there be any, uh, like for example, the NSA revelations were pretty big and there was a big diplomatic fallout. How has the fallout been on uh, this, or has it just been accepted uh, as a commodity on the market, which is fine to buy and sell? I think part of the problem is that people who are very much affected by this and furious about this, uh, there are people who have been tortured in Bahrain and in Morocco because uh, the authorities used Pegasus to catch human rights activists, especially women's rights activists. Uh, and um, in Mexico, the investigation of the 43 disappeared students, which were actually murdered students. Uh, again, lawyers and human rights activists were targeted by Pegasus in order to silence them. This sort of fury, justified fury against the use of uh, spyware, Israeli spyware, to silence human rights activism is distributed around the world. What we need is that people from all of these countries to work together and to combine the information that they have. We need a global campaign to face a global problem. Even when uh, President Macron uh, of France, his own phone was hacked by Israeli spyware, uh, this looked like a moment in which maybe uh, international backlash will, will uh, happen because uh, the president of a powerful Western country uh, has, has been hacked. The Israeli Minister of Defense flew to Paris to personally apologize to Macron and France dropped it. They just allowed it to, to continue to happen. Um, and this, this is really a serious problem. We also see a problem with corporations. Two very large corporations filed lawsuits against NSO Group, Apple and Facebook. That's because their own devices, their own technology, uh, Facebook, which is now called Meta, uh, they own WhatsApp and WhatsApp has been hacked. And the uh, Apple phones, the iPhones, were hacked by, by Pegasus. So they launched lawsuits against the company. And then people said, well, if the big corporations are on our side, we're going to win. But it's not so simple, unfortunately, because uh, what they're doing is they're dragging a very, very long sentence. And in the meantime, a, a, a trial, in the meantime, Apple is already pushing a new set of products where they say we now have phones that are uh, resistant to Spyro. So pay double and we'll give you a product. Uh, which, which is supposed to protect you from uh, spyware, but what they actually are doing, they're profiting from it. 
they are turning the threat of spyware into another source of profit. It creates demand for a new product and they're happy to provide that product. So they now have an interest that their lawsuit against NSO group will never end. And so it, once again, it's back on our shoulders <laughs> as citizens of any country in the world, but uh, we're, we're speaking now in, in Germany, uh, to put uh, to, to launch campaigns and to launch protests so that we make sure that uh, we don't allow these corporations to profit from violating our privacy and our human rights. I think that's a good place to end. Let's hope our viewers will take some action and uh, create awareness of this issue. Uh, independent journalist, economist, and author Shir Heber, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Zane. And thank you guys for tuning in today. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to donate so we can continue to produce independent, non-profit news and analysis. I'm your host, Zen Raza. See you guys next time.